What do you think is going to happen next? I think that they're preparing for pogroms. And I think that law enforcement has to be prepared. And it's absolutely imperative, imperative that the Jewish community protect themselves, that use all legal means possible, including enforcing civil rights law and also demanding, demanding accountability from our members of government to investigate these sources of radicalization and to shut it down immediately. שלום, ברוכים הבאים לפרק 264 נדמה לי של שומר סף שהתנהל באנגלית. אם לא נוח לכם באנגלית אתם מוזמנים ואתם שומעים אותנו באודיו, אתם מוזמנים לוידאו שם יהיו כתוביות בעברית. And my guest today is ברוק גולדסטיין, the uh, lawfare lawyer. שלום ברוק. שלום, thank you for having me. I'm so grateful to be here. It's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. אקטואליותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיותיות
of Hamas, the number two state sponsor, the Hamas designated terrorist group, financial sponsor. And they're also the number one financial sponsor of the educational system in the United States. There's something wrong with that. And yet it's been going on for over, at least in the United States, Qatar has spent over $1 billion a year for the last 10 years. Um, And we've known about it and there's been no accountability. And now we are witnessing uh, the results of that. It's amazing because there's, there's no, there's no direct intellectual uh, connection between the hatred taught in Palestinian books, which is wild Islamic anti-Semitism, which harks back to the Hadith and, and the Quran, and what is taught in the United States, which relies on or, or which is saturated with post-colonial Edward Said kind, mm-hmm. a, a kind of education. But it's amazing that the, the financial route is the same. Right. And they, I mean, it's a trick um, that is often used, and it's the marriage of these two philosophies, the Islamist radical theology married with like a Marxist, communist, anarchist, uh, which it, on its face is is diametrically opposed. But when you focus on a common enemy and what they've done is they've created this so-called Israeli-Palestinian conflict that's manufactured and funded, and they've created it for the purpose of being that scapegoat, um, of creating those blood libel excuses to get out on the street. And now we see in America the defacing and and tearing down and destruction of American monuments. Um, I believe it was there was a, 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 a Palestinian student group that just posted on Twitter and then deleted that they aim for the destruction of the, of America and total revolution and overhaul of the system of of democracy and capitalism. And these are the values of the West that are being attacked. And Israel is a decoy. The Jews are a decoy. The pro-Hamas mobs that are running rampant, I never thought I'd say this, running rampant in America in 2024 are pro-terror mobs on the street, and they're violent mobs. And they're being justified, and they're being... Uh, excused by the mainstream media. They're being supported by certain in the in the radical uh, left um, by Rashida Tlaib, for example, members of government. This has become systemic. And, and, and Kamala Harris, these people are at least sympathetic to the whole range from uh, from BLM all the way up to uh, Tim Waltz now saying that the demonstrators in university are demonstrating for all the right reasons if it, 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 uh, reasons if this is <laughs> if this is also anti-semitism anti-americanism as as i think it it is how can how can you explain that this has become a party that is poised to stay in power while it's promoting something and also financing right the 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 donors for the uh, campus activists are also donors for the democratic party how how has an anti-American philosophy entrenched itself so deeply in a in a governing party? Uh, well, so first of all, I want to make clear that I'm speaking um, from my personal opinion right now, not in the capacity of, of running the Lawfare Project, but in in my personal mm-hmm. opinion. And I find it very alarming that even the issue of anti-Semitism has become politicized, that these charges and accusations, you're an anti-Semite or you're a Jew hatred, they're like a political football. And the most dangerous thing that I see, at least for the Jewish community, and obviously extrapolated for the United States at large, is this division, the disunity. Even in Israel, you know, prior to October 7th, you had pro-reform, anti-reform. And in America, you have this division of the Jewish community over political partisan lines, pro-Trump, anti-Trump, what have you. And it has seeped in and prevented us from acting as a unified whole in the best interests of the community. So even way back, for example, we were the first to file a, um, a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights under an executive order that was issued by former President Trump that modified Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to include protection of religion as a category, not just it was like race and ethnicity, gender, whatever, also religion. Um, And 
half of the community, the Jewish community, could not bring themselves to support the filing of a civil rights claim under Title VI because President Trump is the one who expanded it. And I guarantee you, if former President Obama was the one to move the embassy to Jerusalem, surely I'd be one of the first ones there lining up to praise him. I don't care what party all right, does the right thing. And I think that we need to remember that um, and vote, obviously, keeping in mind not just the interests of Israel. I mean, we are we are Jewish Americans. And like you said, this is an issue about the protection and safety of the Jewish community as a minority community. And we conflate that too much. You know, there's Israel, but then there's also the civil rights movement and the civil rights issue in America, which is separate and apart. We cannot conflate it. Oh, I can't hear you. I'm are you I, I, that's that's my. Where I'm that, yeah. this is, so this is the, this is where your your leverage is, where you take a, a consensus vehicle like civil rights and say Jews have these rights too, which sadly has to be said. So give us an example of how this can operate in in the lawfare project in in a in a concrete case. Okay, so so first of all, you know, I want to say um, just uh, sort of add to what you just said in the sense that um, the more that we respond to anti-Jewish discrimination, which is a civil rights issue with political arguments, with pro-Israel arguments, the more we give them an affirmative defense to discriminate against us. Okay, so let's say I dislike the government of China because of the way they handled COVID. It's not justified for me to go to a Chinese American student and harass him and call him a COVID spreader and discriminate against him because I'm projecting my hatred of the Chinese government on him because the way he looks or where he's born. You know, that's that's racism and everybody would recognize that. So why is it acceptable to go to someone like Jonathan Carton my client, who was a student at Columbia University, an Israeli-American Jew, he was a student, he was 19 years old, spit on him and call him a dirty Zionist baby killer because that's political speech. You're protesting Israel. And we don't respond to that with, well, the amount of babies that the IDF has killed is actually so-and-so. You respond to anti-Jewish discrimination with civil rights methods, whether it's civil rights advocacy, whether it's civil rights lawsuits, the Jewish community deserves equal protection under the law. And it is unlawful to discriminate against a Jewish person because they're Jewish. That is what's happening. Jewish students are being targeted because they're Jewish, Jewish nurses and doctors that we represent, Jewish prisoners that we represent, uh, Jewish employees in, in the tech uh, field that we represent are being treated differently because they're Jewish. And the excuse is, well, I'm upset at Israel for political reasons. That's outrageous and it's completely unacceptable. And so what we've done with the Andrew Hadrian movement and also with the Lawfare Project is civil rights advocacy. What, what was incredible to me is before I founded the Lawfare Project in 2010, there had been no organized strategic legal offense, just like the black community has used with the NAACP or the free speech community uses with the ACLU or the Center for Constitutional Rights or the Muslim community has a legal fund, the Muslim Legal Fund for America, the Council on American Islamic Relations. There was no litigation fund or Jewish civil rights public interest law firm that was dedicated to enforcing the civil rights of the Jewish community using the legal system. And this is as American as apple pie. Because if you think about it, all of the rights that we enjoy as American citizens are mostly products of seminal civil rights cases. We watched the debate last night. It was all about, you know, some of it was about abortion and the Supreme Court case and whether this is a state's right issue or not. The Asian American community just brought a lawsuit against Harvard and won and got rid of affirmative action because it was discriminating against them, right? Brown v. Board of Education, the uh, Roe v. Wade, Brown v. Board got rid of uh, segregation in, in the South. So in so a way, what you're saying, Brooke, is, is how, how did people not think of this before? And 
And let me suggest a, a, a sad explanation. Jews accepted the accusation that they are part of the white hegemony. And therefore, and since uh, civil rights cases are in our imagination only relevant to minorities, Jews have began to think of themselves as those who are um, uh, those who are to pay reparations, not those who are to receive them. Well, no, I, I disagree. I push back on that. Jews were at the forefront of the Black Civil Rights Movement. We were working together with Four the Black blacks. community. Four Blacks. Well, well, and that's my point, NAACP. You know, we, we don't... The problem is themselves. always advocated for others. Exactly. Right. So so why is that? Is it a combination of that? We don't want to recognize victimhood status. Um, something that is remarkable about the Jewish community, obviously, is the fact that we continue to survive and the perseverance. And not only do we survive, but we thrive. And it's used against us. It's a miracle, an incredible achievement that after over six million Jews were killed, my grandparents came to this country, started a new life, raised a healthy family, had a business, and they survived and they thrived. And yet, you know, it's used against us and it also prevents us from accepting that we're traumatized, that we actually are victims and we're being victimized. And then there's the trauma of the fear of standing up for yourself, which is, I think, what, what you were getting at, right? So, I, when I first launched the Lawfare Project, we filed uh, a couple of our first cases. I got a phone call from the CEO of a now defunct, very large uh, Jewish organization who was, frankly, yelling at me, telling me, who do I think I am? I'm coming in. They're engaged in behind the scenes, closed door negotiations. I'm creating more anti-Semitism by filing lawsuits, giving the impression the Jewish community is moneyed up and aggressive. You're too aggressive. And I thought to myself, could you imagine someone in the black community accusing the NAACP of being too aggressive, too aggressively asserting for the civil rights of the black community? I mean, just last week I had a conversation um, this this uh, with, you know, CEOs of more organizations um, who, who serve us well and they do well, but there's a resistance to, to a change of strategy that includes not just top down, but bottom up, including grassroots mobilization, filing civil rights lawsuits, engaging in those types of strategies that have served other minority rights communities. And so when we launched And Jew Hatred, it was done based on a study actually of, of what those strategies and tactics are. And most importantly, was using the legal system as well as engaging in protest and direct actions from the ground up local actions, like really getting into the community, rising up new leadership, training new leadership, um, not necessarily just having to rely on organizations to solve the problem for us. You know, the community is frustrated. Why, why haven't these organizations done more to fight anti-Semitism? Well, you know, it's not what they're doing for us. It, it, what are we doing? We have to mobilize as a community. Each of us have to play a part and people are frustrated because they don't know what to do. So what the movement is doing, and I'll just end with this, is providing strategic support, financial support, and of course, pro bono legal support to enable communities to mobilize for themselves to create the change that they want to see. It's amazing what, what you're saying about the, the fact that some Jews are are afraid to stand up for their rights. And I'll give another example of maybe that that might may illuminate what I tried to say before about Jews thinking them thinking about themselves the way their accusers already think of them coded as white within this within this hierarchy because what you are doing is basically challenging the rigid hierarchy who, of who is supposed to be a victim. So I'll give you I'll give you an example which frustrated me greatly because I was in touch with Eagle Carmon of memory. I don't know if you mm -hmm. if you're yeah, it's a great you're organization. organization. They do they do great work. So they they had a project about imams in mosques in North America. And they found that about 95% of them are spewing wild, violent anti-Semitism. And they collected this trove of information and they went to Jewish organizations and they said, look, there's a danger here. Do something about it. And they were too afraid to be accused of Islamophobia. So the, you say when you say and this goes on all the time when when the, the, the mm -hmm. uh, campus 
pro-Hamas demonstrations erupted, what did the Biden administration do? Create a, 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 a government arm to fight Islamophobia. That's the first thing they did. Yeah. And so this discourse is, is okay. turned against, uh, against Jews in, in the way civil rights have been used. So in, in that sense, what you did is not at all trivial for, I, I'm, I'm guessing, for, for American Jews. Although what you're saying is this, is, this should be the mainstream of human rights discourse because here's a minority and it's discriminated against. But the hierarchy of victimhood has us now in, in the position of a perpetrator. Right. And so, I mean, I wrote my first book on this basic subject. It's called Lawfare, the War Against Free Speech, a First Amendment Guide for Reporting in an Age of Islamist Lawfare. And um, basically, it was about what I call Islamophobomania, uh, which is the attempt and successful attempt uh, for quite some time to silence and to punish the exercise of free speech about national security issues, such as the threat of radical Islam, theologically motivated terrorism, incitement in our mosques. Anybody who, like me, was talking or writing or uh, making movies about it started getting sued. Um, so I was actually operating before the Lawfare Project, a litigation defense fund at the Middle East Forum with Daniel Pipes, where we provided pro bono legal representation to moderate Muslims or members of the counterterrorism community who were sued for warning about these things. Like, for example, when yeah. 17 media defendants were sued for warning about the Islamic Society of Boston, which at that time was getting funding from Saudi Arabia. Uh, people like Daniel Pipes, the Wall Street Journal, wrote articles about how ISB was using that funding allegedly to to, to radicalize their uh, the mosque goers. They were sh uh, they shut down the speech by suing them, and then lo and behold, the Boston bombers come, which were also allegedly radicalized at ISB. And you think that if we were allowed to speak freely. And to investigate, and if the government did its job by investigating the sources of, of funding that are not in our national security interest, would we have had the Boston Marathon bombing attack? I don't think we would have. Um, but there was also threats of violence. Don't forget, you know, people like Gert Wilders or Ayan Hirsi Ali, or even I think it was the Cartoon Network when they were going to do uh, a cartoon on South Park. Um, there are threats of violence and they've tried to silence us. But I think, again, a silver lining, and I hate using that terminology when it comes to October 7th, is that we've woken up, right? The world woke up once before. The world woke up on 9-11 to the threat of radical Islam. And then we were bullied into silence and uh, being complicit and allowing indoctrination over many, many years. And now the world has woken up once again. Uh, after October the 7th and seeing what's going on in the streets of Western democracies. And I hope that they demand accountability. You know, law enforcement obviously should be doing the job, but also attorney generals. Um, Alvin Bragg, for example, um, I think he, 150 people were arrested at the Columbia University encampment and hardly any of those uh, were booked and charged. They, it's like a revolving door. Uh, the system, and it only goes to encourage more violence. Um, and I I hate to say this, but I, I feel like I have a duty. I, I think that they are preparing for pogroms. I think what we're seeing is the steady uh, increase of violence and tactics and testing of law enforcement, how they will react when they show up outside a Jewish synagogue in L.A., in LA, a center of power of Jews, they're going straight to the center, straight to New York. How will law enforcement and the community react when we violently block Jews from entrance in, into the synagogue? Go back, learn their lessons. What do you think is happening next? What do you think is going to happen next? I think that they're preparing for pogroms. And I think that law enforcement has to be prepared. And it's absolutely imperative, imperative that the Jewish community protect themselves, that use all legal means possible, including enforcing civil rights law and also demanding, demanding accountability from our members of government to investigate these sources of radicalization and to shut it down immediately. So should Jews actually be be worried about 
physical viol their physical safety in the United States nowadays? Jews, Jews have always had to worry about their physical safety. And now Jew hatred is rising again as it comes and ebbs and flows, and you just have to open your eyes to see it. But however, I'm not uh, preaching this to instill fear, the opposite, because I am confident that with the unity that we see right now, even though there are still very powerful forces that are trying to divide us, but the unity of the Jewish community and what I see with the end Jew hatred movement and the bravery and the courage of our clients at the Lawfare Project, they are moving mountains they are courageously filing groundbreaking civil rights lawsuits, and we are winning and we are succeeding. And the activists, we have thousands of activists across the country are mobilizing themselves and they are forcing real change to happen because they are leveraging the collective power um, of the communities and they're pushing in the same direction. Thank God. I have a great hope for this country. I love the United States of America, my home. I love this country. It is a blessed country. And I know that the Jewish community together with our allies, which happens to be the majority of Americans, everybody says this is a small but vocal minority, small, vocal, dangerous, violent minorities are dangerous. Okay. Um, but the majority of the United States of America, I think, is is awake and understands what's happening. And I have full faith and confidence that this country will turn itself around. But it's going to take work and it's going to take pressure. And we have to prepare, be prepared to do that work. As, a, as an Israeli, and you can respond any way you like from, from the uh, project or from your own opinion. I, I don't feel that American Jews have woken up. If they don't understand what is going on with the Democratic administration, and I don't want to use harsh Donald Trumpian uh, uh, rhetoric, but if they're going to vote for Kamala Harris, who chooses for her liaison to the Jewish community, a person who is who was who is advancing something right in your in in your field, right? They're they're advancing sanctions against Israeli citizens for political purposes in a way never done before by any administration towards an ally, then people who are voting for that administration are clearly not understanding what uh, Kamala Harris is saying when she says she has sympathy for the uh, feelings of the campus protests. Yeah, I, you know, I agree what's so troubling um, about that particular uh, sanctions issue, uh, which is being implemented currently by the Biden administration. They are sanctioning Jews who are doing business and living in Judea. And it's discriminatory on its face. I mean, if I told you there was an area in Belgium where no Jews are allowed, they're not allowed to live there, they're not allowed to go, or there's a section of Paris and no Jews are allowed, you know, it would be outrageous. But there are no Jews allowed in Judea. This is the policy of the United States of America. It's discriminatory on its face. And frankly, it's illegal. Um, and to sanction individuals based on their religion, um, saying Muslims are, can live in Judea, Christians can live in Judea, Druze, Buddhists, anyone can live in Judea, but Jews. The Jewish presence, this notion that a Jewish person living is some sort of provocation to violence, that they deserve to be attacked, that their presence is illegal, is um, really rooted in the worst kind of bigotry and discrimination, really the type of bigotry that um, underlies and justifies genocide. Because when you dehumanize someone, you take away their humanity, you call their presence illegal, and you say that present is a justification, it's some sort of illegal occupation with, which justifies a, a resistance. This is the whole... Um, uh, M.O. Uh, of this violent movement that kills Jewish babies and burns and rapes women alive. And to see the United States, um, one the, the most incredible democracy in human history, uh, this great country adopt a foreign policy uh, that advocates that type of discrimination is it, it, disappointing and it's dangerous. Brooke, to conclude, um... Let's go back to the bird's eye view. Is the project, uh, except for 
uh, standing up for uh, for uh, individual Jews and fighting uh, discrimination in academia. Is there a, a legal way to get at the Qatari funding too? So um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a legal way to get at the Qatari funding. But now putting on my lawfare project hat, you know, we're very proud to represent um, a student at Carnegie Mellon University, which also happens to be the, I think it's the second or third or fourth largest recipient of Qatari money. They've received reportedly anywhere between 600 to 800 million dollars from Qatar. And we are suing the school for rampant uh, Jew hatred and discrimination. And no doubt, no doubt, there is a causal connection between the outsized grants and the uh, purposes for which those grants are, are being carried out and the effects of it which is the discriminatory and hostile environment against Jews and the spread of disinformation about the Jewish state and whatever other anti-Americanism comes with that as well. And while it is the government's role to investigate illegal foreign funding, because as a, as a citizen, we are limited. We can enforce civil rights law. Um, there's no doubt that this particular uh, anti-discrimination case that we have filed against Carnegie Mellon University uh, will expose what is going on there. And then the question is, what does um, members of government do about it? What, what does someone like Elise Stefanik, uh, who's made it her mission to uncover this issue and to solve it, and, and Virginia Fox, does the government represent uh, the American people, and will they serve our interests by shutting down any foreign funding, not just from Qatar, but it's coming also from China. It's coming from Russia. We see yeah. Iran funding the protests, reports of Iran funding. I mean, hundreds of students don't just show up. You look at them, they're idiots. They look like idiots. They don't just show up with all of this material, with all of these strategy, with all of the same green tents, knowing innately how to lock arms, how to mobilize. Um, I was uh, shown a presentation where at, at each of these campus and campus, there's a yellow vested student who's well trained in keeping out people and they're doing so illegally. And yet law enforcement, especially the schools, are not enforcing their own policies. So while civil rights lawsuits like ours play a huge role, um, the onus really is on the American government to protect us. Brooke Goldstein, thank you very much for uh, coming on this show. In fact, I think I'm going to screen this on our American podcast too, Mike Duran and I on Israel Update. American Jews should hear this in English. And thank you for everything that you are doing. Thank you for everything you're doing and for having me. Like I said before, it's really an honor to be on with you. I've wanted to have this conversation for quite some time. A pleasure and a privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you.